Hello, everyone. My name is Robin Gould Soil, and I want to thank you for participating in this webcast hosted by Bright Talk, where we are titling and speaking about the importance of privacy in the age of technology. Before I go into uh, the presentation, I thought I would go and give you a little bit more about who I am and my bio. I have worked in the area of privacy. I'm sorry, I'm going back a slide. Let's see. I've worked in the area of data privacy for over 20 years. My background, I have had the privilege and opportunity to work in several financial services in the healthcare sector, as well as I did an interchange, executive interchange program with the Privacy Commissioner of Canada where I had the opportunity to oversee all investigations units uh, during the period of 2010 to 2012 and did outreach and, um, and engagement with different organizations. And prior to getting into the space of data protection and privacy, I have an IT background and I worked in information management and developed different systems and for different financial institutions. So I am very happy to take these two topics of my whole career and kind of join them together. Today, at the end of the presentation, what I'm hoping that you will take away is you'll have a better understanding of the importance of privacy protections in the age of technology. You have a better understanding of how of some technology concepts and strategies and tools to help build uh, a better compliance program and build it into technology and also provide you with some tips and tools that you can refer back to after the presentation. I will be holding all questions till the end of the presentation, so but please feel free to enter them under the questions from the audience. And if we don't have time today to answer them, you have my email address. You can send them to me and I'd be more than happy to answer your particular question. Uh, lastly, under the attachment of links, you will see that I did provide you with four tools that you can download at your own leisure, as well as I'll reference to them again as I go through the presentation. So now let's begin. I came across an article in the New York Times that was written by Charles Warta. He interviewed a U.S. presidential candidate for the next election. And in his presentation, he asked, he chose to speak to Andrew Yang because he had put data privacy as a campaign policy. And I found that Andrew Yang so eloquently presented the realities of the current state of privacy that I captured it on the very first slide. He basically summarized and said, you know, E as society are avid users of the internet. And we've begun this now at early ages. Individuals are completely at the mercy of technology companies in terms of what happens to their data. Companies pretend that it's the individual's choice about how we use their data, but really they don't really understand because very few people read the terms and conditions and everybody always, including myself, scrolls down to the bottom and hits I agree. And finally, we are probably trading cost and convenience by forfeiting our data. So overall, my theory is like we can't afford not to be considering privacy protection in technology because the world we live in today is all about technology and the Internet of Things and how we use our data. Um, that's everything that we do in today's society. Um, I think it is such a big topic that, you know, if we go back or 50 years later, we'll refer back and think about this particular age might be as big of a change as what's happened in the climate change um, today and some of the issues we have. Um, it might, by not looking at the opportunities and the benefits, we may not foresee some of all the downfalls till it's too late. And I think that's what we're seeing very much in the climate change scenario. 
Today, I think we look at privacy as now a customer experience opportunity. And if we like it or we don't, there's more and more laws coming out about privacy protections every single day. And if you don't think, if you think this theory is just myself, I thought I'd pull a few quotes that I just actually read about from 2020 predictions on privacy. And I can tell you, Dimitri Citro, from the CEO of Big ID, he kind of summed up uh, some very interesting topics. And he said, Siri, are you listening? Over collection of consumer data has been an issue for quite some time. But the introduction of small home devices like Amazon Alexa and Google's Nest have exponentially accelerated consumer data collection, much of which is superficialist and lacking in value. Large and small organizations are not sure what to do with the data and how to identify its sensitivity. We have Rakesh Gansen said privacy laws will result to increased focus on employment and cat employee accountability. You'll see as I go through, you know, as technologists and engineers and developers, you have a very important role to play within this particular space. And finally, I'm going to quote another person, George Gershow. He's from Sumo Logic. Um, he basically said, to avoid disruption in business and day-to-day -day operations, we're going to see an increasing demand for the tech industry to come together to streamline privacy and adopt consumer uh, privacy by design mindset. So those are just a few other examples of individuals who are saying similar um, ideas as I had just presented. And you know privacy has hit Main Street and basically it's talked about a lot everywhere. It, we are in the years of prime time for privacy, and it's exciting time if you're a pr chief privacy officer. Uh, a few areas that you ha actually had not seen traditionally, but you now it is basically in every where you look, is in government elections. Every political party has a platform. I just mentioned it uh, before for someone in the U.S., but I live in Canada, so specifically in our last election, Definitely, privacy was on every one of the leaders' platforms. And basically, there was a recognition that for Canada's future goal to be a global hub of technology and innovation, we need to believe on consumer trust. And we need to understand the technology is using massive amounts of data. And there's been a correlation and a recognition that maintaining consumer trust and a positive engagement all relies on the data economy and all that needs and requires privacy protection. You'll also see a number of surveys done by many, many organizations about the attitudes of individuals on privacy concerns. And that really started many years ago, beginning probably with the Snowden Red revelations. It got added on with all of the, um, I guess, um, introductions of the GDPR and compliance with that particular law now with the CPA law within the U.S., and, you know, some very big scandals like privacy, uh, the Cambridge Analytics scandal. And if you're really in Canada, you may be familiar with the Stats Canada incident where uh, Stats Can it connect, basically um, collect census data from Canadian citizens, and they actually put a proposal out that was not well received by Canadians where they wanted to go directly to banks rather than collecting the data uh, about their financial situations from individuals. Uh, we also have a survey from Pricewaterhouse in 2019 on consumer intelligence services that basically say 85% of consumers say cybersecurity and privacy risks are among the biggest and uh, many issues facing society today. If that isn't enough, you start seeing it in the news every day, the media, and you see so many movies and TV shows now all talking about this. For example, we had The Great Hack uh, by Netflix, a 2019 documentary about um, where they talked about how the data company Cambridge Analytics uh, came to symbolize the dark side of the social media in the wake of the 2016 U.S. presidential election. We had the movie Her. 2017, where a man falls in love with Siri on his Apple phone, 
Or we had the movie Circle in 2017, which was about an individual landing her dream job and being an IT professional about a social media company. So you're seeing it everywhere. We all have technology companies coming out and asking for more like regulation. Um, we had Mark Zuckerberg say, technology is a major part of our lives, and companies such as Facebook have immense responsibilities. He believes that we need more active role for governments and regulations to ensure that we maintain and keep the protections of individuals. Or the other way, we just have Apple like having ads about privacy because they see it so foundational for them in order to particularly use your product. If you're wondering if it's um, also on the mainstream is now there is so much software out there to help support demonstrating compliance with privacy. Um, one of the attachments I put in was the IAPP tech survey that talks about how much money has been invested in uh, privacy and startups now and the type of tools that actually are coming out to demonstrate compliance. And finally, what you're going to see is now there's so many privacy technology standards that are emerging um, on the marketplace. Most recently, we had the NIST privacy standard um, release, which is talking about risk and privacy controls and how to balance those particular controls when you're building them into technology. That is one of the attachments and the links that I've included that everybody could read on. We have the ISO standard um, for 2701, which talks about safeguards, but they have put an addendum on it now that is specifically focused on privacy management. We have the high tech standard, and we even have something called development digital uh, principles. So when you're developing um, in the digital environment, one of the principles, which I'll go into a little bit further, really focuses on privacy and security. Moving along, my slide will move along. Okay. Very sensitive, I apologize, it's skipping. So I'm gonna go back one slide. So why is it so much fuss? And so I think I've you know, repeated myself a little bit, but I think we've come to the time where we recognize that it is an advantage for a consumer. Consumers are voicing their societal attitudes now as they begin to understand the impacts on how their day-to-day -day lives are being impacted by how technology is using their data. We're starting to see more and more stories about too many bad outcomes for customers. We're seeing companies are prioritizing competitive pressures over consumer protection. We've seen corporations not demonstrate their accountability. We're seeing more and more class action uh, suits and lawsuits, um, which is causing an increased cost to organizations. And all of that, when you kind of summarize it, is like basically we're starting to recognize finally that privacy is foundational to confidentiality, trust, and protection, and it is what's going to drive the economy as we move forward. I'm going to talk a little bit about where privacy is in in Canada. So um, I would say Canada really also does recognize uh, privacy as a customer opportunity, and they recognize that it builds trust and um, when you protect their data, and it is becoming foundational pillar in um, whether or not Canada will become. Um, innovative and, and have a digital economy. And it is really, really important. And what we're going to see is legislative changes in the future. And in those areas that they're particularly looking at is on safe and ethical processing of data, whether or not we have control and consent for the data. It's about whether or not we're transparent about the practices that we are using it's whether or not we have accountability and we can demonstrate that we're doing and saying what we're doing and it's about having the appropriate enforcement powers in order to address the violations when something goes wrong um, other areas that they're kind of considering is you know 
should privacy become more of a fundamental human right or leave it as the balanced judgment between innovation and protection? Um, other discussions are about who owns the data. Um, how is it being, mon like, if individuals are, do they have the right to receive monetization on the value of the data if companies are using it? You know, what benefit should they get? Uh, what are the what are the harms that may arise from these individuals, and how much of this should stay in a principle base? How much of this should become prescriptive? And once again, as I mentioned, the powers of enforcement. So, if anyone is new to privacy and listening to this for the very first time, I'm not going to go through all the laws. I'm kind of going to summarize what privacy is really about for you in 10 seconds, you know, or less. And from a technology perspective, it's really about the life cycle of information uh, and of data from the time you collect it till the time that you end it. And it's basically saying you need to have purposes to collect, use, disclose, limit the information to what is necessary. You shall be keeping it as long as you have it. You shall have the appropriate consent. You should give the right to access to individuals to know what's actually going on, and you better have some processes around showing that you're compliant, which goes to the governance and transparency. And when you're thinking about it, there's never the perfect world. So a lot about privacy is about good judgment and about balance and really assessing risk from not an organizational basis, but also from a consumer perspective. And finally, on the compliance real side of it, it's about, you know, say what you do and do what you, what you say. Um, if I was going to go back into some of the law within Canada about some of the ideas in all of that, specifically from a technology perspective, in the digital charter that's under consultation that will be the lead up to how we uh, transform uh, the Canadian privacy legislation, uh, some of the ideas are being taken out of the GDPR or from the CPPA now because that's the latest thinking and say, how are we going to give those rights back to individuals? So things that they're considering is data portability. How are you going to allow a person move their information if they decide they don't want to work or, or um be a client of a company and move it to another one. What data should be portable? What shouldn't be portable? Um, how can you get a company to delete information if you don't want to have any business dealings with them? What is the right amount? How should that particularly happen? How should I keep my information de-identified? How much do they have to know about me on an individual basis or not? So those are some of the technological assessments that are actually happening uh, right now, and hopefully they will say principle-based and not become too prescriptive in legislation because, as we all know, technology evolves and changes, and we need to have legislation that will allow us to move forward on that. I'm going to go a little bit deeper now into the technology and sort of how, how it fits in, and I'm going to talk about four areas. Some of the technology tools that have emerged um, in the marketplace uh, that really kind of help support a privacy office, uh, privacy design, what it is, what it means, privacy enhancing technology, what it is, what it means, and some examples, and the digital privacy security principles. So if we start off with how technology fits in to support uh, privacy officer. You know, when I started this 20 years ago, there was no technology support to do anything. Everything was by hand um, or using just Excel spreadsheets. You know, fast forward 20 years, now there's all these automated tools. And so there's automated tools that are around to help you understand all the different laws, first of all, because there are so many and it is a patchwork. And then and they all even may have the high level same principles, it's in the detail that makes the differences. Uh, two, you have assessment tools, you know, to understand your risks on the compliance side. You have incident response tools, things that help you when things go wrong, how to manage it. 
Um, there's tools that help you do your data governance and your inventory and mapping out your data flows and understanding the sensitivity around your data so that you can define it. You can have your web scanning tools that help check whether or not your uh, clients' websites are following what you say your cookie policies are and you understand what is happening in the application level with cookies and beacons and, and other trackers because you may need to be, ensure compliance and demonstrate that to regulators or to individuals who have rights. There's also um, activity monitoring tools now. So there's tools that can go in that can find out where the data is and generate right rates access requests and fill them out for you and then tell you where your data is gone within your organization. These are all tools that will help out in the accountability principle to help demonstrate that you know how you are managing client data. There's other tools that are coming out that are kind of more in other areas, um, which is more uh, in terms of consent management, which is like managing the rights of individuals so that you have record keeping of when they want to provide consent or take away consent for tracking your information. And then there's even some tools that are more on uh, de-identification and um, which are more considered privacy enhancing technologies, which I'll talk a little bit more in a few minutes. And finally, there's those traditional safeguarding data leakage tools that are out there that have been around for some particular time. If we move into privacy by design, that is a concept that is so used so widely and has so many different meanings. But if we start back at the basics, it was created by Anne Kukian, um, and she developed these principles probably back in 2008, 2009, and they actually get adopted at the International Privacy um, Data Protection um, meeting that happened in 2010, where everybody around the world, the data protection officers, uh, signed on to a resolution that they'll actually build privacy by design um, and look for those activities when they're demonstrating compliance with privacy legislations. It became so fast forward that how you actually saw that concept built into the GDPR. And those seven foundations are really about an attitude, an approach to really demonstrate how a company or an individual thinks about privacy and how they, I would say, operationalize that within their organization. And it looks at far more than just technology. It looks at governance and administrative controls and policies and procedures and training. It looks at, you know, the full gamut of activities. But if we bring it back into the technology space, so what does privacy by design mean when it comes to technology? It really means nothing more than data protection through a technology design. Another way of looking at it is you need to consider privacy at the initial design stages and through the complete development process of a new product, the process, the service that is, involves processing personal data. So really, if you have a gatekeeping program for product due diligence and you have different stages that you need to go through, you would have to embed privacy considerations all the way into the, that gatekeeping framework. If you are designing a new system and you're building you know, system design requirements, you have to think about writing in the requirements that is going to support uh, protection of individual data or maintaining the rights of how you use their data. And so that is how you build that privacy by design component into technology. When it comes to privacy enhancing technologies, so what is that? Um, privacy enhancing technologies are technologies that embody fundamental data protection principles. By example, minimizing personal data use, maximizing data security, and empowering individuals. A useful definition from ESNA, which is another attachment that I put in the paper, 
you know, state that software and hardware solutions, for example, systems encompassing technical process, methods, or knowledge to achieve specific privacy or data protection functionality, or to protect against risks of privacy of an individual or a group of natural persons. So I know it's confusing. Pets sometimes are linked very closely to the concept of privacy by design, but really they're the technical measures to help you put in place in your design that kind of suggest you've taken a privacy by design attitude. Some examples of uh, pets would be de-identification, pseudonymization, right? Um, some emerging technologies, you know, people are, think they're a bit controversial yet, and you know, but they're trying to see how they evolve and have their uses. Is something called differential privacy, um, and those are systems that introduce randomness into user data sets in order to de-anonymize tactics from succeeding in re-identifying information is usually used in concepts of analytics and in research. There's another emerging technology which is called homeographic encryption, which is as on another layer of security by allowing machine language algorithms to operate um, using data without decrypting. So there's just more and more ways that technology can actually either add protection, minimize use, or reduce identification that falls under these particular tools. And they're constantly evolving and write papers. So I've provided you with a link to one that gives you a really full gamut of a whole series of different opportunities of technologies that can be used. And then when you're actually using them, it also tells you some of the pros and cons and some of the better scenarios about when to use some of these type of technology. We also have the technology that you have to consider like blockchain. So blockchain in itself is just a use of technology, but it's how you implement it that'll either make it privacy prone or not. And we've seen some very good examples out on the marketplace where Blockchain has added an advantage um, to privacy and its de-identification, and some of that is used in tools of identity management. Finally, if we move to the next slide, is it going to go? Uh, oh, there. No, it went two slides. Very slow. All right. Um, these are the principles for digital development. Another attachment. So basically what this is, is a living set of guidance intended to help practitioners or who are developing applications and software in, into digital technologies about a way to be successful. And one of the principles in these digital principles is that how do you um, address privacy and security. And they gave you some principles which I put on the screen and will read. But then when you go further down into these particular principles, it gives you the considerations at the different stages of your development life cycle. So what do you think about when you're building your requirements and analyzing the business situation? What do you think about when you're actually coding? What do you think about when you're finally testing and implementing? And then once you've implemented, what are the things that you should consider about testing to make sure it actually works? So it's a very good set of uh, toolkits in order to help you. Uh, so some of these principles, when you look at it, it's what it's taking is the principles out of legislations, of guidance, and putting it into a context of how you would place it into technology. So one, you have to think about your data ownership and who can have access to the data and where you're collecting it and how you're capturing it. Um, you think about what is the best interest of your end users and the individuals who are collecting it um, at, at the beginning uh, before you move forward. Then you think about how you know you should be securing that. Is there any ethical considerations that should be applied to this area? What risks and benefits are you particularly looking at? You know, who can have access to the data? 
you know, or unauthorized access? And is there any area of, of linkage? You know, how much has got to be identifiable or not? And as we go through, I'm going to give you a couple more examples, digging down about how you actually apply some of those principles. So if you're a developer or an engineer, you know, these are things that, you know, you should be thinking about. You need to be educated on the technical controls, which is why I provided you with some examples to take away afterwards. Think about privacy as a default. So rather than going in with attitudes that I want all the data to be shared with everybody, go in with the attitude that nobody gets to see the data unless they need it, right? And if you work on that principle of minimization all the way through, it it's extremely helpful. If you're not sure of how to address it, you should go engage with a person who is responsible for compliance with privacy because it is their job to keep up with some of these things and they will become very helpful or very insightful in having a good conversation with you about those trigger questions about how to address it within your actual design. I'm going to give you um, a few more examples of somebody I participated in and listened to a panel at the Privacy Engineer section at IAPP last September. And there was an engineer there, Rafi Bahadi, that gave some really, really good technical controls that help educate people on privacy and the way that you need to think about it. And so one thing is he said, you know, you should be thinking about how you sanitize your data feeds. It's important to know when not to keep the personal data. Applications not used for the purpose of analyzing sensitive personal data should not have access to it. The most obvious risk is accumulation of data in various places. Some of them may be unknown. There is also the risk of applications breaking when the data is suddenly removed as an afterthought. A good business practice is keep the sensitive customer data out of the analytic databases. So simple, right? This can be achieved by programmatically controlling application access to sensitivity. So that's really the architecture and the person who's thinking about setting it up. Do you really even need there? Why bring yourself some um, potential risks if you don't need to? Another simple concept is splitting up the data workflow. Um, another important design consider is the ability to identify where personal information is present in the data processing pipeline. Otherwise, analytics becomes challenging and businesses run the risk of violating data re regulation. A good practice is to adopt a wall garden strategy and split up the process to trace sensitive data and prevent it from spreading into unintended or unknown places. Another example is isolating sensitive data storage. Having a plan to isolate data allows a business to keep things manageable. It can keep challenging you to separate, se sorry, to separate sensitive data when the storage is in several places and too many data repositories with multiple dependencies introduce inconsistencies when applying requirements. Good business practices are Separate the storage of the sensitive data from non-sensitive data. Adding friction to but not blocking access to sensitive data can be used as a signal to indicate that it's merits of a higher degree of scrutiny. A couple more examples that are more on the safeguarding side is really thinking about how you should store your data. Should you be storing data in databases in an encrypted format, in a mass format, or really in plain text view for someone to read. Um, you should think about what data is going to be available in your public facing environment. If you're thinking about encrypting the data, make sure you don't leave the keys to the encryption very close technically in the design um, as to where the encryption keys are. So if you get hacked or you have a cyber attack, you're not making it so easy for that hacker to get access to the keys to do the de-encryption. Those are just some 
you know, examples I could go on and on that I kind of chose that kind of hit home that are simple and straightforward and common sense of things that you can do that really enhance and bring in privacy uh, into the conversation. So if you're more of a tech executive and you're not down in the weeds anymore, um, you know, so what are the things that you should consider? So one, you should be having some design standards within your organization that become acceptable, that you're willing to live with, that actually support the culture um, of privacy. You should ensure that you have values about you know, brought into every design decision about how are you protecting the customer in the short term or in the long term. You may need to set up governance structures that have the right people around the table asking those particular questions because everybody has their role and will see the data from the lens of what their role is. And you need to have all of those different perspectives together and have inclusion or diversity, I would say, of thinking in order to make sure that you're actually catching all those particular risks. And then you really want to challenge yourself in terms of, you know, whatever you're doing, is that the right thing to do, right? Even though the law says we can do it, we have to think about those ethical considerations about should we be doing it? Those are just some of those actual um, downsides of when you're looking at your risk assessment that one should consider. And, you know, if one slide I didn't put in here, but I will talk to it, is, you know, if you're the privacy officer, you know, what do you need to do? Well, I think the role of the privacy officer has completely changed in the last 20 years about who your stakeholder partners are. You know, 20 years ago, you basically, the concepts were still the same, but it was more your role in order to understand, and you were more about writing policies or responding to a complaint or responding to a particular incident. I think time has evolved now where you become part of the design team and you need to be very versed in technology and these type of um, differences in what technology you use when, and you need to become part of the development life cycle to ask those same questions. Uh, traditionally, privacy officers were brought in at the end, sign off, did I do a good job? That is not the way to build privacy in design. You are very much now need to be part of the development team as a person that goes in and helps make decisions at the time you are designing whatever application. So privacy officers really do need to have an understanding and the baselines, not only of safeguard and protections, but of also the new technology tools that are out there and work more iteratively with the IT department. So I think it is very much important that you know, in traditional days, you had an HR person there, you had a legal person there, and compliance and audit and security. But now you really need to have your data governance people for sure at the table. You need to have your developers at the table who set those standards so that you know that you are embedding the appropriate privacy considerations all the way through an organization. Um, I think I'm really kind of coming to the end and leaving a few minutes uh, for questions now. So hopefully you have a better idea how you can get involved, especially on the technology side, and uh, do your part. On that, I will leave it to see if there's any questions right now. Okay, I see one question coming in. And basically that question is, is what do you see is some of the biggest challenges privacy officers, you know, are having now in understanding um, technology? And so I think um, one of the biggest challenges is still getting in at the beginning. Uh, I, I see many privacy officers not get engaged until after a product is really ready to go live. 
And then they come in and they ask all these great questions and um, they do not uh, have the answers to them. And then there's too much time going back in placing in the design in order to make the changes. So it doesn't generally get implemented. So I think the challenge still for privacy officer is knocking on the doors of those IT developers or those project managers or designers and and winning their support and talking about uh, the considerations from a programmer or developer's point of view. I think the next challenge is is always budget. Um, I think everybody understands the risks and don't doesn't want to have uh, a non-compliance issue, but I don't think there's been a good enough job of understanding now with these technology tools is how to embed them within the organization, how to add budget to the organization um, in order to bring in some of these tools and what is the value of, of bringing in these tools. Um, I think the CPPA may be the first to show it and the GVPR with the right of access. I have seen so many new tools come out on the market that are trolling through your technology in order to help fulfill that need. Saying that, those technology companies also need to satisfy uh, organizations that in the benefit that they're providing, they're not also increasing any risks to them as an organization. And having that dialogue and that conversation of mixing between business decision, policy decision, and technical decision is is one that's still emerging um, and getting all the right stakeholders in place in order to do that. So those would be the two areas that I think that I have. Um, is there any other questions that I see coming in? I don't see any others other than maybe making sure that they can see the attachments. Uh, so just to summarize, the attachments that I did provide to you is the IAPP technology application. And in that one, they give you all the different emerging technologies and what they're used for and who you can contact and all the different particular features. It's a very good uh, overview and balance of different tools on the marketplace. Uh, I gave you the design uh, privacy, sorry, privacy enhancing technology papers that goes through all the different types of technology available for you to consider um, using and the benefits of each one of those. I gave you the digital um, principles document of developing digital applications and all the principles that you would have through the life cycle of your particular data. Those are the ones that I gave. And I think we're at the end. So I want to thank you for joining me. Um, I hope you all want to get involved and do your part. And we'll take advantage of understanding how privacy is built into technology and the importance of it. Thank you.